We're going to deal with a very difficult subject, uh, extremely controversial, not in the sense that it has caused um, division uh, of men to the point where they refuse to have fellowship. I don't know two preachers uh, or two churches who will not fellowship because of their differences on this issue. I have some very, very good friends, very close friends that disagree with me on this issue. Uh, and so... This is not, uh, as the other subjects that we've looked at, is it's not a subject that will determine whether I'm going to fellowship with you or not. Uh, but it is uh, an issue, and uh, there's been much debate uh, in church history as to what this passage of Scripture is teaching in Genesis 6. Now, in Genesis 6, what we find is a description of the world before the flood, right before the flood the condition of humanity and what was taking place, some of the things that were taking place uh, in this world. And then in Genesis chapter 7, God sends the flood uh, and destroys all humanity. So that's the context here. This is pre-flood world. How it was, Jesus referred to it in Matthew 24 as the days of Noah. Uh, before the flood, how things were and and in this section of Scripture, when he's describing how things were before the flood, uh, Moses writes these words in Genesis 6, beginning at verse number 1. He says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives... Uh, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, uh, we could probably spend five or six lessons just on these four verses. We don't have that kind of time. I, I do want to focus just for a moment on the portions of Scripture here that we're going to uh, hone in on and try to see what the Bible says. Verse number one, men begin to multiply uh, and, and they had daughters, that's, that's obvious. But in verse number two, it says, the sons of God, who are they? That's, that's very important in our understanding of this text. Who are the sons of God? Well, whoever they are, they saw the daughters of men, that they were fair or beautiful. And they uh, took them wives of all which they chose. In verse three, it's a loaded verse as well. I don't have time uh, to handle verse number three. Uh, not at this point in time, but maybe some point in time in the future, we'll look at it. But verse number four, there were giants in the earth in those days, those days before the flood, uh, the pre-flood days, there were giants in the earth. There were giants roaming the earth before the flood. It also says, it says here that also after that, after the flood, giants roamed the earth. Moses had to deal with, uh, with giants. Uh, Joshua had to deal with them. David had to deal with them. Uh, it, uh, giants were pretty known in, in Bible days. And so before the flood and after the flood, there were giants roaming the earth. The question is, does the Bible here tell us how those giants got here, who they were? Does the Bible say from this text that we just read, how the giants got here. Now, many will tell you, no, the verses here do not tell us how the giants got here. The Bible just teaches that the fact uh, that there were giants here. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to examine to see if the Bible is clear on how the giants got here. These giants that were on the earth. And why were they here? Why did they roam the earth uh, in that day? So we're going to try to answer some of these questions. Um, there's a couple of uh, theories, a couple of um, different teachings as to, well, there's probably more than, there's more than uh, three, four, five, probably, uh, different teaching as to who these sons of God are, who the daughters of men are, and where these giants came from. I'll give you one of the most popular ones. Uh, one of the more popular 
uh, theories or interpretations of this text is, and here, here it is, that the sons of God, mentioned in verse number two, are sons or descendants of Seth. In other words, Seth, uh, is, is uh, the godly son of Adam, and he begins a godly line, a godly lineage. And, um, you know, they're saved, they're saved individuals, and you see the lineage there in chapter 5, you see Seth's uh, lineage and his descendants. And so the sons of God are saved, sons and grandsons and great-grandsons and so on and so forth, of uh, Seth, and they see daughters of men, which would be, this is the interpretation, lost women uh, from Cain's descendants. And so you have Seth's descendants who are saved and Cain's descendants. By the way, you find Cain's lineage in chapter number four. Chapter four, you find Cain's lineage. So you have Cain's lineage, it's an ungodly line, lost people. And you have Seth's lineage, which they're all saved and it's a godly line. And so the sons of Seth, called sons of God here uh, because they're saved. The sons of God look at the daughters of men, the beautiful granddaughters of Cain who were lost and lust after them and married them and they intermarry. It's not a racial issue, it's a spiritual issue according to this, uh, to this teaching that it's saved men yoking up with unsaved women. And because this became a pattern before the flood, it just corrupted the world and, and everything got worse. And then God sent the flood. That sounds pretty solid. I know some very, very godly men, good men, love Jesus, love God's word, who teach that very thing. I was personally taught uh, that, uh, that same thing from men of God in my life. I was taught uh, that principle. And, uh, and some very good men. I was reading some commentaries today uh, of men who... who Hold to that belief. My favorite commentary, John Gill. I was reading him today. John Gill stated that's what he believed. He's my favorite commentator. And he said, that's what I believe. It's the saved sons of Seth mingling with the lost daughters of Cain. Um, that's one of the more popular uh, theories. Another one would be just simply not necessarily in the lineage of Seth or the lineage of Cain, but save men in general, mixing with lost women in general, uh, caused uh, the corruption of humanity, and then God had to send the flood. Uh, that's a couple of theories. Another one, however, uh, is the sons of God, that phrase, sons of God, being a reference to angels, in particular, fallen angels. And angels mingling themselves and even marrying, the Bible says, women. The sons of God, angelic beings, mixing with, with women. And the theory there is that that mingling of the two produced giants, produced the giants, the giant race that was here on the earth. The other two theories, by the way, the, the ungodly line of, line of Cain and the godly line of Seth mingling or the saved men, lost women mingling. Those two theories say that this text doesn't teach where the giants come from. We don't know, according to those theories, where the giants come from. All we know is how the world got corrupted. The Bible just states the fact that there were giants. However, the theory that says angels mix with women, that theory states clearly, we know how the giants got here. They got here through the mingling of angelic, fallen angelic beings, not, not, uh, not you know, the elect angels, the good angels, but fallen angels mixing with, with women here on earth. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the theory. So you say, well, preacher, which one are you? Uh, I'm number three. I'm number three. Uh, I am convinced, and by the way, let me say this. I haven't always believed that. Uh, most of my early Christian life, I believed, I believed personally in the, the descendants of Seth, mingling with the descendants of Cain, the sons of God being Seth's descendants, and, and uh, the daughters of men being Cain's descendants. That's what I was taught. That's what I believed. Then I, I started noticing some very good men who love God, love God's word, differing strongly. Uh, and I decided one day, well, I, I'm going to, I want to study this for myself. I want to know what the Bible actually says. 
And I began to run the references. I began to study the Word of God and see all the places uh, where these related things are taking place and find out what the Bible says. And I came to the conclusion that though I, I was taught by a number of very, very good men, I had to disagree with them. I felt that they were incorrect in their interpretation. I'm going to give you the reasons why uh, here in just a, a little bit. I want to say, in my humble opinion, the reason why these wonderful men like John Gill and Matthew Henry and some of the other ones uh, and, 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 uh, and really good men today, in fact, good friends of mine even today, that disagree with my stance on this text, I, I believe I have found the main reason why. And it has nothing to do with interpretation of Scripture. I believe they're interpreting Scripture because of this one issue that they have. Uh, I believe that they cannot come to grips with this being angels mixing with women for one reason. It's too strange. It's too weird. It's too odd. It's too UFO-y for them. They, 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 they're struggling with that. And because it's so odd, they refuse to give themselves to it. And therefore, they reinterpret the scriptures to fit their own, their own viewpoint uh, because it doesn't feel as weird. Now, let me say this. Don't ever let strangeness or weirdness determine your interpretation of scripture because you don't have a problem with Jonah and the great fish if that's the case. Jesus said it was a whale. Well, you're going to have some problems with Jonah. You're going to have problems with the three Hebrew, Hebrew boys in that fire furnace. Uh, you're going to have some problems with uh, Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. That's a little odd. That's not an everyday occurrence. You're going to have some issues with the miracles of Jesus Christ. That's, a, that's different. That's, that's, that's not normal. And so just because it's outside of the norm, <clears throat> that, that doesn't give you grounds to reject it. Now, I will say this. Here's why I think these brethren can reject what I'm saying and still be considered, you know, godly, Bible-believing Christians. Uh, if you reject Jonah, you're, you're a rank heretic. You, you reject Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being the fiery furnace, you're a heretic. You, you reject Jesus' miracles, you're a heretic. Uh, you're a heretic. Those are strange things, but you reject those, you're a heretic. How can, how can you reject angels here and still uh, not be a heretic? Because this text is not nearly as explicit. Jonah is explicit. Uh, Daniel is explicit in his teaching. The, the gospels, the four gospels, and talk about the miracles of Christ, they're absolutely explicit. Moses is a little more vague here. And you can understand why somebody could insert another interpretation and yet still be a Jesus-loving, Jesus-preaching, Bible-loving preacher. It's not nearly as explicit. But at the same time, just because it's odd doesn't mean you discard it. If, if, that's, if that's how I'm going to discard Scripture or interpretations, there's going to be a whole lot of other things I'm going to have to discard because they're odd as well. And so it being strange should not be a reason for your rejection of it. By the way, what's that old saying? That truth is stranger than fiction. You ever heard that? Truth is stranger than fiction. I believe this is one of those cases. The truth that angels mix with women is a lot more stranger than the fiction that it was Seth's line mingling with Cain's line. It, it's, it's odd. But I'm going to show you tonight that I'm convinced it's scriptural. It's biblical. It actually happened. I don't know. I'm looking at the clock. I don't know if I'll get finished tonight, uh, but we'll go as far as we can. Uh, and then uh, the next time uh, we'll take it up again. But let me start with this. Looking at that godly line versus the ungodly line. Sometimes, sometimes before you build something up, you got to tear something down. Now, that's just part of life. Sometimes, brother, you've been in construction, Jake. You, you, sometimes you've got to take something away before you can put something up. So we're going to tear something down first. That's where we're going to start. And this idea of the godly line of Seth mingling with the ungodly line of Cain, we need to deal with that first. Let's start there and, uh, and see what the Bible teaches. Now, the teaching is Seth's lineage is godly. You find that lineage in Genesis chapter 5. And Cain's lineage is ungodly. You find that lineage in Genesis chapter 4. Um, before I get into that, let me say this. I do believe in what the Bible calls a goodly heritage. I do believe that. 
Write this verse reference down. Psalm 16, verse 6. Psalm 16, verse 6 speaks of a goodly heritage. I am part of a goodly heritage. My mom and daddy were saved and I was born and they gave me the gospel and I've given my children the gospel. That is a goodly heritage. It is, it is one generation passing down to the next generation the things of God. I'm a part of a goodly heritage. Many of you are as well. You, you, you can trace your family back and see the saints of God in your family line. Uh, I do believe in a goodly heritage. Uh, I also believe that there can be a badly heritage, and that's not a Bible term, but uh, it, it would be the opposite. Now, there are some people who their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were not Christian, were not saved, and so they were not passed down the things of God, yet they get saved anyway. Uh, I believe in a goodly heritage. I believe that that if your ancestors, your parents, your grandparents, if there are Christians in your family, you've got a better chance of getting saved than someone whose family lineage has nothing to do with Christianity or the church. Uh, more people get saved who are somehow connected to another Christian in their family than those who get saved not connected in their family. Now, praise the Lord, some people get saved. Um, my wife, when she was growing up, had nobody to take her to church. She had a young girl uh, when Kelly was about 16 years old. Um, uh, one of her friends invited her to church. I'm not even sure if that friend herself was even saved, uh, but she invited her to church, and Kelly started going to church. Kelly's mom and daddy didn't go. Kelly's grandparents, as far as I know, didn't go. There, there was no goodly heritage there. She just went with a friend, and she got saved, and uh, then her younger sisters got saved, and uh, now she she is helping me pass on a goodly heritage to our children. Uh, but I had a better chance of getting saved than she did. My mom and daddy had me in church. I was born on a Tuesday. I was in church on Sunday as a little baby. And so I, I've heard the gospel my whole life. She had not until she was 16 years old. And so I'm from a goodly heritage. She's from a badly heritage. Uh, but nonetheless, both of us got saved because God's grace can reach in both, both, both sections. But I had the better chance, if I can use that term. I had a better chance because I grew up in it. I had a better chance than she did. If you understand what I'm saying? So I believe in a goodly heritage. Seth, in chapter 5, obviously passed down a goodly heritage. He got it from his daddy. He, re, he believed what Adam taught him. He passed his goodly heritage on, and you see that in the lives of the men uh, that followed him in his ancestry. As, or his descendants. Cain, that would be a badly heritage. Cain, in chapter 4, he rejected God, rejected the things of God. First John, you want to write this verse down about Cain. First John 3, 12 said that Cain was of that wicked one. He was a follower of the devil. Cain, was a, Cain went to hell. Seth went to heaven. Cain went to hell. We know that. Cain had a badly heritage, Seth had a goodly heritage. I absolutely believe in a goodly heritage. However, I think, this is my humble opinion, it may not sound too humble when I say it, but I believe that the interpretation that men have used that the sons of God are the godly lineage of Seth and that the daughters of men are the ungodly daughters of Cain, I believe that is absolutely one of the most, one of the worst interpretations of Scripture in the history of interpretations of Scripture. It is so borderline heresy that the men who teach it don't even realize it. They, they don't realize how, how close to heresy that teaching is. Let me say this. There is no such thing as a human godly line. There's a goodly heritage where I pass down my goodly heritage to my next generation, but I don't pass down a godly line. Me, if I am godly, my godliness does not determine my children's godliness. You understand? I can give them my heritage, but I can't give them my godliness. That's something they have to do on their own. I'm not going to heaven because my parents, my dad's in heaven, my mom's going to heaven. I'm not going to heaven because of that. Now, 
I had a real good, better chance of getting there because they were saved. I have a goodly heritage. But that doesn't determine that I'm going. A godly line is you're passing down what you are to the next generation, and that determines what the next generation is. That's not necessarily the case. That next generation can say no to the things of God and walk away from the things of God. Therefore, there is no such thing as a godly line and ungodly line. Goodly heritage, yes, but not a line of godliness. In fact, can I say this? Who are we to say that everybody in Cain's lineage went to hell? What verse is that? I know Cain went. Why do we put everybody else in his family there? Who's to say that his descendants didn't get saved? You know, Cain married his sister. That's Adam and Eve's daughter. The same lessons they gave Cain, they gave her. Who's to say she didn't believe Adam? Who's to say she didn't believe her mama? Well, then that means she'd been married to a lost man. That happens all the time. All the time. You, you'll see a woman in church. Pray for my husband. He's never been saved. Why are we putting Cain's wife in hell? In fact, uh, look at chapter 4. Look at some of the grandsons of, of Cain. In verse number 20 of chapter 4, And Ada bare Jabal, and he, now these are descendants of Cain now, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. Uh, God, he's got a gift. God may have very well given that gift. Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer uh, in brass and iron. Uh, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. I'm mean, here. You've got Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal Cain, and they have tremendous gifts. They have great wisdom. Why do we have to give the devil credit for that? Why does the devil have to get credit for them having all that wisdom? Here in America, the medical and the technological and the industrial advancements that we've made in the last 150 years since the 1800s, you know why we made those advancements? It's because this country was founded on Bible principles. And because men uh, stood on Bible principles, God gave men wisdom. Now, we have come to the place where we're in love with the blessings instead of the blesser, I understand. But the fact of the matter is, we are what we are because this country at one time respected the things of God. What was, what was that, uh, uh, the, the black scientist, Washington, what was his? Uh, George Washington Carver. That's it. George Washington Carver. He, he come, how, how many uses for the peanut? I should have wrote this down. I mean, like a hundred uses, if not more, of a peanut. I can think of two. Put salt on it, eat it, and spread it on my sandwich. He come up with like a hundred uses of the peanut. You know what he, you know what he said? He said, I was, somebody asked him, how, how did he come up with that wisdom? He said, just reading my Bible and praying and talking to the Lord. Spending time in God's word and God began to talk to me. He had that, that, that wisdom and that, uh, that, that scientific advancement through his relationship with the Lord. In chapter 4, verse number 26, Seth gives birth, or his wife gives birth to a son named Enos. And the last part of the verse says, Then when Enos was born, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Men in general. It doesn't say what men, just says men in general. Why couldn't that be some of Cain's? descendants. I mean, it sounds like that was a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival breaking out early in, in human history. They began to call upon the name of the Lord. Why could that, not, that be anybody in Cain? Now listen, everybody in Cain's family may be in hell today. I'm not saying they're in heaven. I'm just saying, what verse are we standing on to say that they all went to hell? Cain's the only one that we know. And why should I give credit for Jubal being the father of the harp and the organ to, to the devil. David played the harp. The, the, the book of Psalms said that we're to worship God with the organ. In fact, God even took Jubal's name and applied it to one of his great feasts, the year of Jubilee that took place on the Day of Atonement. He took that man's name and applied it to one of his holy feasts. 
Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I got, I got just as much of uh, argument as you do that Jubal's in heaven today. May not be. He may not be. I don't know. But I think we've taken this thing way too far, this godly line, ungodly line, because there's no such thing. You get saved because you trust the Lord or you go to hell because you reject him. Not because of your line. Now, a goodly heritage can pass some things on, uh, but not uh, from a human standpoint. In fact, this idea of the two lineages, if I saw, I read that John Gill today, just, it almost broke my heart. I'm like, Come on, Johnny, you can do better than that. Uh, this godly line of Seth mixing with the ungodly line of Cain, that's only two lineages. Adam gave birth to at least four. Look at chapter five. Chapter five and look at verse number four. Verse number four. Chapter five, verse four of Genesis. And the days of Adam after he begat Seth were 800 years and he, Adam, begat sons. That's the S on the end of it. That's at least two. And daughters. So he's given birth to Cain. He also gave birth to, to Abel, but Abel's dead. Cain, Seth, and at least two sons here. More than likely, they grew up, got married. That's at least four lineages, maybe five, six, seven or more. We don't know how many sons Adam had. But he had at least four that could have passed a lineage. So what about their descendants? Were they saved? Were they lost? I mean, we're making a big deal out of those two lineages. What about the others that, that aren't mentioned in Scripture? And there is a reason why we have these two in Scripture. Cain, we have his because you read his descendants, you see the influence of Cain's lineage on humanity. Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal Cain, for, for instance. Seth's lineage, we, we see it listed. That Seth's lineage is listed again in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. It's the lineage of the Messiah. In Luke, Luke starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam right through Seth. And this same lineage, to show that Jesus was the son of man. He was, he was related to Adam. He was the descendant of Adam. And that's the reason why we have these two prominent lineages. But there's not just two. And everybody gives that theory was well, the line of Cain and the line of Seth. Well, you got two other lines you got to deal with. What about those guys? What about those fellas? Now, I do believe, let me say this. Humanly speaking, there cannot be a godly line and an ungodly line, humanly speaking. I do, however, believe in a godly line and an ungodly line. It's just not Seth and Cain. You say, well, what is the godly line and ungodly line? Well, write this verse down, Malachi 2, verse number 15. Malachi 2, I'm not going to make a turn there, just write the verse down. Malachi 2, verse 15, speaks of God seeking after a godly seed. God seeking after a godly seed. You read Malachi 2, 15, you'll see that he's seeking a godly seed. Now write this verse down because this next verse I'm going to give you tells you what the godly seed is. Galatians 3, verse 16. Galatians 3, verse 16. I know according to that verse what the godly seed is. I'll read the verse to you. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the godly seed is Jesus. Well, who's the ungodly seed? Write this verse down. Romans 5, verse 12. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, Sin, there's your ungodliness. Sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. There's your ungodly line. Who is that? That's Adam. I believe in a godly line and an ungodly line. I believe I'm born the first time in the ungodly line. I was conceived in sin, Psalm 51 verse 5. But when I got born again, I got put in the godly line. I was born ungodly in Adam. I'm now in the godly line in Christ. It's not Seth and Cain. That's, that's almost heresy. That's almost, y'all have heard of the, the, the teaching called covenant theology? Covenant theology 
in essence teaches my kids are going to heaven because I'm going to heaven. That's heresy. Salvation is a personal issue between an individual and God. It's not based on who mommy and daddy is. And that's, that's how close. I, that's, I'm not saying a man who gets to do not go out here and say, Brother Wampler said, if you teach the Seth Cain lineage theory, you're teaching heresy. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're scratching the surface. They're getting real close to it. Riding that line a little too close to covenant theology. It's not the case. Uh, the only godly and ungodly line there is is Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we read the verse a moment ago in Genesis 4, verse 26, where the Bible says, and men began to call upon the name of the Lord. When Enos, Seth's son, was born, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And the question arises, well, what happened to those men? Those godly men, uh, the, the, those who propose the theory that it's some lineage of some sort and not angels, they'll say, well, what happened to those men that called upon the name of the Lord? And their quest, their, the answer to their question is that these godly men corrupted their own way by mingling with, with lost women. Uh, that's the theory. These Godly saved men started mixing with sinner women and corrupted their way and corrupted humanity. Now, some portions, let me say this real quick before I, before I do this. Some portions of our lesson I'm going to actually read. I'm trying to cover this as thoroughly as I can, so forgive me at the moments where I'm not just speaking, I'm actually reading. Uh, let me read my thoughts here to you concerning uh, the answer to that issue about uh, it's a saved man mixing with a lost woman and that's how everything got corrupted. It should be noted that in the biblical text, in the Bible, what it says, this is nowhere stated. It's never said. It's never stated. And it's simply based upon one's belief in the godly, ungodly line principle. The idea that saved men were corrupted by lost women in Genesis 6 is assumed upon the text and is not sound exegesis. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Exegesis is when you study the Bible and you let the Bible say what it's supposed to say. You take your teaching straight from the text. Eisegesis is when you insert in the text what you think it means. And I'm convinced that the godly, ungodly, godly line theory is, is eisegesis. They're inserting something in there because of their own Desire to interpret a certain way. They, they stick their own interpretation in there. And that's not good exegesis. Let me explain to you why. Let me give you some thoughts about why uh, that thought is absolutely poor, poor handling of Scripture. First of all, notice in Genesis 6, uh, 6 2, well, 1 and 2, it doesn't matter. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it speaks of the daughters. The daughters are born of men in verse number 1. The, they're, they're called the daughters of men in verse number 2. Though well, the question is, who are these daughters? Well, the lineage guys say that you know, well, you know, these are the daughters of Cain. And, and others will just say they're, they're lost women. Let me say this. There's no doubt these women are lost. No question. These women are are lost. There's something bad about what these women are doing. They're not saved, okay? These are these daughters of men are not saved women. There's no, no doubt about that. But notice it calls them the daughters of men. The daughters of men. Now, those who hold to the Seth Cain lineage theory, they'll say that these daughters are descendants of Cain. Now, we're not going to read all the verses, but if you want to, at some point in time, take time and read Genesis chapter 4, uh, starting about verse 16, on down to about verse 24, and read the lineage of Cain. And I want you to find out how many times the word daughters is mentioned in that lineage. I'm going to go ahead and tell you how many times. None. Now, we do know that Cain's lineage had daughters. I'm not so foolish to think that no, no girls are born of his lineage. Of course, there were daughters. It just so happened God made sure he didn't mention any. Not one. Now, but that's, that's supposedly where these daughters are supposed to come from. But you read the text and there's no daughters mentioned in Cain's lineage. Only the men are supposed to come from Seth's lineage, not the daughters. The daughters are Cain. 
But then you read Seth's lineage in chapter 5, and you know what you find out? Every man on the page had at least two daughters, except for Noah. Noah was the first of Adam's lineage, they mentioned in chapter 5, that did not have a daughter. He only had three sons. Every other one, Seth, Enos, every one of them, Halil, Canaan, Jared, Enoch, every one of them, had sons and daughters. So if you're going, we're going to go just on the words of Scripture, the daughters of men. I would say, comparing the Bible with the Bible, that these daughters, a lot of them, came from Seth as well. Every one of his descendants, including himself, had at least two daughters. So these daughters of men, they belong just as much. Don't misunderstand me. I believe some of these girls come from Cain's lineage. I believe some of these girls come from Seth's lineage. I believe these girls come from them unnamed sons of Adam as well. They're all producing sons and daughters. I have no issue with that. But to strictly say these daughters of men are straight from Cain is absolute biblical goofiness when it never even mentions daughters in chapter 4 and it mentions them in every son except Noah in chapter number chapter number 5. Now, what about, what about these men in verse number 6, excuse me, chapter number 6, verse number 1, men began to multiply on the face of the earth. The assumption is that those are Cain's descendants. Well, you know, men began to multiply. Cain's descendants began to multiply and had daughters. But here's the issue. In chapter 4, verse 26, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. How many men were around when Enos was born? Enos is Seth's first son. Seth has a, probably a couple of brothers. And maybe a couple of those brothers may have had a son or two. So it's either his brothers, ex with the exception of Cain, or his, or his nephews. Do you understand? Oh, not a whole lot of men around. So these men calling upon the name of the Lord, we're not talking about just Seth's lineage. It's got to be Seth's brothers too. It's got to be a nephew or two. And then you read Cain's lineage and you read Seth's lineage and you read the fact that everybody's having sons and daughters. This men is not specifying just one group, one family saying this family starts to multiply. Everybody's multiplied. Adam has at least four sons and at least four daughters. We know he has at least four daughters. One married Cain, one married Seth, and he had two more mentioned in verse number four of chapter five. So every, Adam's having a bunch of babies. Seth's having a bunch of babies. Everybody's multiplying. It is a general term that's not specifying one family. Men, men called on the name of the Lord. Men begin to multiply and have daughters. And men that are having the daughters, the Bible says in chapter 5, every one of those men except Noah had daughters. We know that the men that are multiplying having daughters includes Seth's lineage. It has to. It has to. Now, my question is to those who hold to that idea of Seth's lineage versus Cain's lineage is what about Enos? What about Canaan? What about Mahalalel? Are they not men? Were they not multiplying? Did they not have daughters while they were multiplying? Of course they did. And so therefore, the, the idea of a Seth Cain lineage intermingling is absolute foolishness. But let me say this. Let me add this to it. Notice the term sons of God. Verse number two of chapter six, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And notice the phrase, phraseology here. Sons, males, sons of God, daughters. Now, in the New Testament, son of God, sons of God can be generic. It, it would apply to a lady just as much as a man. All saved people in the New Testament are the sons of God. Okay? We, we know that. As many as received him, male or female, gave he the power to become the sons of God. You understand? So in, it's, it's a generic term in, in the New Testament. It can't be generic here, however, because it's contrasted with daughters of men. You understand? So this is women only mingling with male only. Do y'all see that? Sons of God, daughters of men. You say, well, well, what's the, 
what's the big deal about uh, sons of God mingling with daughters of men? Here's the theory. It's saved boys mixing with lost girls only. Where are the saved girls mixing with the lost boys? The text only says male son of God mixing with female daughter of men. Do you understand? Here you have a very corrupt society, so corrupt that God destroyed it all with water, except for one family. And you're telling me in that corrupt society, not one saved girl got married to a lost man? That hap that's been happening for 2,000 years in the church age. Save women marrying lost men. That happens. And you tell me God only has a problem with a saved man marrying a lost woman? Why doesn't he mention, and the daughters of God mixed with, uh, you know, the sons of men? Why not argue that? Why did God have a problem with that issue? That would be just as corrupting as a saved man marrying a lost woman. Do y'all understand what my thought is? I mean, you, you're going to have to, if you're going to believe that, that, that the sons of God are human men, then you've also got to believe that God has a problem with saved men marrying lost women that doesn't have nearly a bigger problem with a saved woman marrying a lost man. That's stupid. That's not even, you're not even trying to study your Bible at that point in time. Of course he has a problem with both. Also, as I said a minute ago, in the New Testament, women are included in the term sons of God. Are they not? They are. John uh, 1, 12, Romans 8, 14 and 19, Philippians 2, 15, John, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. I mean, all, all these verses, uh, you can go study that yourself. These are, these are easy verses. We are all the sons of God. We, we are all a part of that group. But not here. Can't be. Because they're distinguished with daughters, with daughters. And it's also insinuating that uh, no saved woman ever married a lost man. But let's, let's, let's be, I'm, I'm going to finish with this one here. Let's talk about that term sons of God real quickly. So, we see there's no godly line, it cannot be. But we also see that if you're going to hold to the human sons of God, mix it with human daughters of men, then you can't have human saved women marrying unsaved men. So what about this term sons of God? Let's examine what the Bible says about the term sons of God, then I'm going to be done. There are at least four, if I can say groups, individuals and groups in the Bible that are referred to as son of God or sons of God. The first one is obvious, absolutely clear, Jesus. Jesus, 46 times in the Bible, is referred to as the son of God. No doubt about it. Um, there's another man, and he's the only other man in the entire Bible called the Son of God. The only one. Jesus is called the Son of God. There's one other man who's called the Son of God. We've mentioned him already when I talked about the ungodly line and the, uh, and the godly line and who they are. Jesus is the Son of God. Write this reference down, Luke 3, 38. Luke 3, 38. Adam is called the Son of God. Of God. He's the only individual man called A or the. Luke 3, 38. Very important verse. We're going to go look at it in just a minute. So, Jesus, the Son of God. Adam is called the Son of God. Uh, the book of Job. I'll give you one reverence. It's all. Job 1, uh, chapter 1 uh, shows it. Uh, I believe Job 2 as well. I just put in my notes Job 38, 7. Job 38, 7. Angels are called sons of God. Angels are called sons of God. I think I said four groups. There's actually five. There's five. So you got Jesus, you got Adam, and in Job 38, 7, you have angels. Here's another one. Christians, New Testament saints, are called sons of God. If you want, you want one verse, write down John 1, 12 as your proof text. Whereas means received him to them, gave you power to become the sons of God. So Christians are Sons of God. And, and there's many other verses as well. Well, there's another one a lot of people don't think about. The nation of Israel. Israel is called a son of God. Um, in the millennial reign of Christ. Here, let me give you a couple of verse references here. Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7. 
Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 43. By the way, y'all do not abbreviate books of the Bible, don't you? Yeah, you got to learn to abbreviate. You're going to take notes in church, you got to abbreviate. You can't write out Deuteronomy. You got, it's D-E. Deuteronomy is D-E, period. Don't write it out. It'll take you too long. You got to learn to abbreviate your Bible. Come up with your own system or whatever. Luke is L-K. You know, Romans is R-O. You know, don't, don't write them out, all right? Matthew, M-T. Mark, M-K. And uh, that, that'll be a simple way of, uh, of, of trying to do this. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Hosea 1, verse 10. And those verses teach that Israel in the millennial reign shall be called the sons of the living God. So we got five groups. We got Jesus, Adam, angels, Christians, and Israel in the, in the millennial reign. Well, let's think about this. The sons of God in Genesis 6 can't be Jesus. He's sinless. What they're doing in Genesis 6 is sin. It's bad. Eliminates Jesus. It can't be Israel. It can't be Israel. Throw that one out. You say, why can't it be Israel? They haven't showed up yet. Abraham's not even born yet. So it can't be Israel. Let's get, let's get rid of, of Israel as well. So it can't be Jesus. It can't be, it can't be Adam. It's the sons of God, not the son of God, Adam, uh, Adam, uh, Adam saved. These guys have some problems. Adam, Adam saved. He's right. It's not Adam. Uh, so, therefore, it's one of two groups. It's either angels or it's the saints of God. It's either angels or the saints of God. We've got to figure out who these sons of God are. Is it angels or is it the saints of God? Well, let me ask you this question. Why is anybody called Son of God. Now let me let me exclude Jesus from this one because he's the Son of God from a different context. So we're going to look at everybody else: Adam and Israel and Christians and angels. Why are we called sons of God? We need to find a common denominator as to why we are called sons of God. Well, uh, some claim that the term sons of God is given exclusively to saved individuals. Adam was saved. Uh, Christians are saved. Future Israel is going to be saved. And so those three groups have a common denominator of salvation. The problem is the angels. Has there been a saved angel? Angels were created in a perfect environment. A group of them fell. The rest of them stayed. They're called elect angels, but no angel has ever had to repent or could repent. Once an angel fell, that's it. There's no redemption for them. There's no saved angels. So that can't be the common denominator. So that means angels are called sons of God for a different reason. We got to find why are they called the sons of God like you and I are. Um, so it's not, it's not a term exclusively used for saved individuals. Some would say that uh, the, sons, the term sons of God would be used because it means, it means an individual that has a right, they're saved and they have a right relationship with God. And they're a son of God. They're saved and have a right relationship with God. I, I've had somebody tell me that. I believe that's somebody that has a right relationship with God. Then you've got another serious problem. What happens if I sin and I'm out of fellowship with God? Am I a son of God at that point? Now some believe you can lose your salvation. We'll talk to them at a different time. I'm assuming you believe in eternal security. You go to 1 John, 1 John, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Ch chapter 2, verse 1 says, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I think, or that's verse 2. 1 John 2, 2. If you see it. But at the same time, chapter 3 says, behold, 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 says, behold, now are we the sons of God. He doesn't say you're a son of God based upon whether you sin or not. You're a son of God. If you're in a, listen, when I grew up in my daddy's house, sometimes I had a great relationship with my daddy. Sometimes I had a bad relationship with my daddy. Either way, I was still his son. I was still his son. So obviously in Genesis 6, it's not talking about guys who are in a right relationship. If they were in a right relationship, they wouldn't have been looking at the daughters to begin with like they were. There, there's an issue there as well. So what is the common denominator? I'm going, to be, I'm going to be done tonight with this. We'll finish it next time. What is the common denominator that, that makes us all called the sons of God? We're called sons of God. 
Well, other than Jesus, there is a common. We're going to leave him out because uh, he's a he's a special. Uh, he has a special reason why he's called the Son of God. And it's not because of the reason we are. Take your Bible. Go to Luke Luke uh, three thirty eight. I think this would be a good place to show you. Go to Luke three thirty eight. This would be a good spot to show you why we are called sons of God. Go to Luke three thirty eight. I've had I've had people tell me, you know, how how can these be angels when people in the New Testament are called sons of God? Yes, but why are we called sons of God? Son of God is not a term that just means salvation, or the angels would be saved angels, and there's no such thing. Look at chapter. 3 of Luke. Let's start looking at verse number 37. This is, this is Luke going backwards to what Moses wrote in Genesis 5. Genesis 5, Moses writes the lineage, lineage starting with Adam. Here in Luke 3, uh, Luke's going backwards. Verse 37. Uh, in the last part of verse 36, Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Mahalalel, uh, which was the son of Canaan, uh, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, think about this. What, what are we saying here? Uh, look at verse 38. Enos, he came from Canaan, or Canaan. Seth, in which was the son of Seth. So that means Enos came from Seth, which was the son of Adam. Seth came from Adam, which was the son of God. Adam came from God. Y'all see that? Why is he called the Son of God? Because he came straight from God. Now, he's the Son of God. If that means salvation, why aren't some of these other fellows called the Son of God? How about Enoch? He didn't even see death. He got raptured. But he's not called the Son of God. He's called the Son of Jared. Adam is the only one called Son of God because it doesn't mean salvation. It's applied to those who are saved, but it doesn't mean salvation. It means you came straight from God. You're a direct creation of God. Think about this. Adam is called the son of God because he is a direct creation of God. Angels would be called in Job 38. They're called the sons of God. You know why? Because they are direct creations of God. Angels don't have mommies and daddies. They were created straight from God. Israel, the nation of Israel, you said, now where in the world does it say that they are a direct creation of God? You wrote the verse down a minute ago. I'll read it to you. Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him. Talk about Israel. God said, I have created Israel for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. He calls Israel a him and says, I created him. Israel is a creation of God. Did you know that the New Testament Christian is a direct creation of God? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or creation. Galatians 6, 15 says that we are new creatures. Ephesians 2, 10 says we are created in Christ. Now, let me, let me, I mean, you, you want these verses, write them down. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you're taking notes, and 2 Corinthians 2, C-O-R dot, and then you're done, all righty? That's how you do 2 Corinthians. Galatians, G-A period, 6.15. Galatians 6.15, we're a new creature. Go study these yourself. Ephesians, you've got two verses in Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 4, verse 24. Both of those said we're created. Our self, when we got saved, we were created. Colossians 3.10, Colossians 3.10 said we are created, our, 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 our new man is created in him, in Christ. We're created. So we are direct creations of God. Now, as stated earlier, the identity of these sons of God in Genesis 6 has been narrowed. It can't be Jesus, it can't be Adam, it can't be Israel. So it's either saved men, not women, because the men married the daughters. So it's got to be either saved men or angels.